The distinction between the Father and Son. Hebrews 2, 14 through 17 states, Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil. For this reason, he had to be made like them, fully human in every way. So someone pre-existed his birth to share in humanity, to be made fully like all humans are made in every way. 1 Timothy 3.16 states that God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the Spirit. So the Spirit of God manifested himself in the flesh, according to Hebrews 2, 14-17, to share in our humanity, to be made fully human in every way. Luke 1, 35 says, and I quote, The Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. So the Holy Spirit of God came upon the Virgin Mary, and for that reason, the Holy Child would be called the Son of God. So for what reason was the Son called the Son of God in the first place? Because the Holy Spirit came upon the Virgin to supernaturally perform the act of the Incarnation to be made exactly like His brethren, fully human, as all humans are made. Matthew 1.20 says, and I quote, The child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. So the angel said to Joseph, the husband of Mary, that the child who would be conceived in the virgin is of the Holy Spirit. The scriptures inform us that the Holy Spirit of God descended upon the virgin in Luke 1.35 and Matthew 1.20 to share in their humanity. Hebrews 2, 14-17 proves that someone pre-existed to partake of flesh and blood in order to share in their humanity. Who then is the he who partook of flesh and blood to share in our humanity in Hebrews 2, 14? Who is the he who was manifest in the flesh in 1 Timothy 3, 16? Who then is that he who pre-existed the life of Abraham in John 8.58 when Jesus said, Before Abraham was, I am. Who then is that Yahweh who would become our salvation as the stone which the builders rejected? Psalm 118.14-23 says Yahweh, but Mark 12.10-11 says Jesus. And who is the one whose holy arm was revealed as a true man? Isaiah 52 and Isaiah 53, 1 says, Yahweh. But John 12, 37 through 9, through 39 says, Jesus. The Son of God could not have pre-existed as a son because the word son simply means an offspring or an inheritor. Only a true offspring of someone else can be a real son. That is why Hebrews 1.5 cites 2 Samuel 7.14 to prove that God the Father said, I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. Hence, God the Father said in the Hebrew Scriptures that he would be a father to the son in the future, and that the son would be a true son to him in the prophetic future rather than in eternity past. For Hebrews 2.17 states that he partook of flesh and blood and he was made fully human in every way, just like all men are. God as God never had a mother. But God with us as a true man, as a true offspring of God, could have a mother. Therefore we know that there is a definite distinction between God as the omnipresent Father, whose Holy Spirit has always filled the heavens and the earth, and that God with us, who was made manifest in the flesh, as a real human being. Hence, the only true God is the unchangeable Father, according to Malachi 
outside of the incarnation. While the Son of God is the offspring of that God, as the same God with us inside the incarnation, as a true man, a true human being, who was miraculously conceived and born by the power of the Holy Spirit of God himself. If Jesus is not God, who also became a man, then how is it that Jesus can now hear and answer prayer according to John 14, 14? And how is it that Jesus now fills all things according to Ephesians 4, 10? And how is it that Jesus' spirit now indwells all true believers who have faith in him? When God became a man, he had to be made like them, fully human in every way in order to save humanity. Since God is not ontologically a man, we know that the Son of God could not be God as God, but only God with us as a true and legitimate man, for God became a man. Wherefore, inspired scripture proves that the Holy Spirit of God who became a man via incarnation through the Virgin was made exactly like all men with a human spirit as well as a human body. Jesus is not just God manifest in a physical external form of flesh, but God really became a man. He was made fully human in every way with a human spirit, soul, and body. This explains how Jesus had a true human nature who could actually experience temptations. This also explains how Jesus had a genuine human ability to pray and have a loving relationship with God as his Father, just as any man could. The early Christians believed that God became a true man. Early Christian writers such as Ignatius of Antioch and Methedes, who were taught by the original apostles within the first century, did not believe that the Son of God always existed as a son. Ignatius had taught that God had become a man in his epistle to the Ephesians 7.2, rather than a son becoming a man. Ignatius to the Ephesians 7.2, and I quote, There is one physician, both physical and spiritual, born and unborn, God become man, true life and death, sprung both from Mary and from God, first subject to sufferings, and then incapable of it, Jesus Christ our Lord. Ignatius's seven genuine epistles to the churches in Asia Minor in the early part of the 2nd century, somewhere between 100 AD and 117, prove that the early Christians of Asia Minor, who were taught by the original apostles, also believed that the Son of God is God who became a man by being sprung both from Mary and from God. Since the churches of Asia Minor were in fellowship with each other, it is highly unlikely that their teachings differed from that of Ignatius of Antioch and the original apostles. Wherefore, the apostolic teaching of the earliest Christians was that God became a true man who was sprung both from Mary, a true human mother, a human being, and from God, from the Holy Spirit of God who descended upon the Virgin in Luke 135. This means that the Christ child was formed from Mary's human DNA, united with the indescribable divine DNA with male chromosomes provided by the Holy Spirit when God incarnated himself as a true man through the Virgin Mary. For Jesus could not have been born as a man child if he was merely a clone of his mother. There had to be male chromosomes involved for Jesus to be born as a true man. In the 11th chapter of his epistle to Diognetus, Methedes presents himself as having been a disciple of the original apostles, who came forward as a teacher of the Gentiles, ministering worthily to them. Methedes wrote in his epistle to Diognetus, chapter 11, and I quote, This is he who, being from everlasting, is today called the Son. Notice that Methodius speaks of Christ as being the He who is from everlasting, is today called the Son. 
according to Methides, the sun was not called the sun until today. Well, that's exactly like Luke 135 says. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child, which shall be born of Mary, shall be called the Son of God. So the Son was not called the Son until today. Of course, prophetically, we find God saying in Psalm 2-7 uh, that he would be a, a father to the Son in the future. God the Father said, uh, This day, you are my Son, this day have I begotten you. So again, in Hebrews 1-5, God said, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. So we know that the father was not always a father to the son, and the son was not always a son to his father until today, until Christ was actually conceived and born from the Virgin Mary. Methides identified the son as the father in his epistle to Diognetus chapter 9. So according to Methides, who was a disciple of the original apostles in the first century, the Son is the man who is today called the Son. But the He who is from everlasting is the Father. Because there's only one true God, the Father, and Jesus is the arm of Yahweh, that only true God, the Father, revealed to us as a true man, a true Son. Methides wrote to Diognetus in chapter 19, and I quote, God being manifested as a man the Son in 1 Timothy 3.16, and man displaying the power as God. But neither was the former a mere imagination. God, before being manifested as a man, nor did the second imply a bare humanity, the Son. But the one was absolutely true, who is God, and the other an economical arrangement, namely the Son. Now that received a beginning speaking of the Son, which was perfected by God. Now take a close look at this quote from Methides to Diognetus chapter 19. Methides had identified the Son as an economical arrangement rather than a living pre-incarnate Son before God was manifested as a man. He described the word, the Logos of God, as an impersonal that before it received a beginning, as the child born and son given. The Apostle John did the same in 1 John 1 1 when he opened his first epistle by saying, That which was from the beginning, rather than he who was from the beginning. There is not a single early Christian writer on record before the mid third century. Whoever believed that the Son always literally existed as a Son throughout eternity past. Therefore, the historical data proves that there were no true Trinitarians living within the first few centuries of the early Christian era. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. That means he's the image of the invisible Father. For John 17, 3 says that the Father is the only true God. The words God the Son, or similar phrases, uh, appear 31 times in the Greek New Testament. But we never find God the Son or God the Holy Spirit. We always find God the Father. Therefore, the Holy Spirit must be the manifestation of God, His Spirit, in action. And the Word that was made flesh is the word, the Logos, the express thought of the only true God, the Father himself, who became a true man when the word was made flesh. John 1.14 Hebrews 1.3 informs us that Jesus as a son is the Father's person reproduced as the express image of the Father's person as a human person. And I quote, Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. Whose person? The brightness of the Father's glory and the express image of the Father's person. Rather than being the brightness of his own glory and the express image of his own divine person, 
Jesus as the Son of God the Father is the brightness of God the Father's glory and the exact image of God the Father's person as a fully complete human person. Because Hebrews 2.17 says that the he who partook of flesh and blood to share in our humanity was made exactly like his brethren, fully human in every way, for God became a man. Hebrews 1.3 in the ESV says, He, the Son, is the radiance of the glory of God, the only true God the Father, and the exact imprint of His nature, the Father's nature, as a reproduction of a human being as a human nature. So Jesus is the radiance of the Father's glory and the exact print, imprint of the divine nature as a fully complete human being. Hebrews 1.3 informs us that the Spirit of God reproduced an exact imprint, the Greek word character means imprint, of God's divine person in nature to form the person called the Son of God. The Greek word character proves that Jesus as a fully human son was reproduced as an exact imprint or copy of the Father's hypostasis, meaning person, substance of being, or nature, as a fully complete human being. For the Son could not have always existed as a reproduced copy of the Father's personal substance and nature of being without having a beginning. For something that is reproduced or imprinted or copied could not have always existed as a copy. Hebrews 2, 14 through 17 proves that the Son was reproduced as an exact copy of the Father's person, the Father's substance of being, the Father's nature, by being made like them, like all humans are made, fully human in every way. This explains how Jesus was able to pray and be tempted just like all men can be. God is not tempted of evil, neither does he tempt any man. So Jesus was not tempted as God person number two. Jesus was not tempted as God the Father. No, he was tempted as a true man because God became a true man who was subject to sufferings and subject to temptations like all men are. If Jesus was just God with us as God, then he could not die, nor could he pray, nor could he have been tempted by the devil. There is not a single scripture in the Bible to prove that the Son was literally made before his virgin conception and birth through the Virgin Mary. Jesus as a Son is called the firstborn of all creation in Colossians 1.15 in the same sense that he is called the Lamb slain from the creation of the world in Revelation 13.8. Just as Jesus could not have been literally slain twice, once before creation and a second time after his birth in Bethlehem, so Jesus as a son could not have been born twice either. 1 Peter 1.20 proves that the son was foreknown before the creation of the world. A foreknown son could not have always existed before being foreknown. Matthew 1.20 and Luke 1.35 proves why the Son of God was called the Son in the first place. He was called the Son because of his virgin conception and birth from the Virgin Mary. Therefore the Son became a living Son by being granted a life from the Father through his birth. That's exactly what Jesus said in John 5.26. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. If the words of inspired scripture mean anything, then the Son of God could not have always existed as a son before being granted a life in himself. Notice that the Son was granted to have life in himself. That means he could not have always been a son throughout eternity past. Because the title Son means an offspring or an inheritor. Jesus could not have been a, a offspring throughout eternity past because there must have been a time when the Son was actually reproduced as an imprinted copy of the Father's substance of being, nature or person, as a human being, as a human person, by the Father's power through His Spirit. Jesus is the firstborn among many brethren. 
Romans 8, 29, 30 says, and I quote, those whom he foreknew, the Greek word is prognosko, which means to know beforehand. Those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren, the firstborn among many human beings. And those whom he predestined, he also called, justified, and glorified. Notice that the inspired text of Scripture says that those that God predestined were already called, justified, and glorified before they were actually born. So Jesus is the firstborn among many brethren because he is the firstborn of all of God's elect who would be born after him in the fullness of times. Romans 8, 29 through 30 also informs us when the foreknown son would become a living son. Jesus as a son is called the firstborn among many brethren because he was born at Bethlehem. He was born first in God's mind and plan before God's elect were born in God's mind before creation. But he was not literally born just like we, God's elect, were not literally born before the creation. So that's why Jesus is called the firstborn among many brethren before he was literally born in the fullness of time. For the Son of God and God's elect were already foreknown and already predestined before the creation of the world actually took place. Hence, the Son of God is called the firstborn among many brethren long before the many brethren were actually born on the earth. Therefore, God's elect were already predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son so that he would be, in the future, the firstborn among many brethren before the creation of the world actually took place. Wherefore, the Son of God was already the firstborn among many brethren in the foreknowledge of God in his foreknown plan before the creation of the world just as Christ's brethren were also born after the firstborn in God's predestined plan. Romans 8.30 concludes by saying, and I quote, And those whom he predestined, he also called, justified, and glorified, past tense. These scriptural facts prove that God's elect were already called, justified, and glorified before they were actually born on the earth as men and women. Therefore, God's elect were already born after the firstborn, after Christ, by being already conformed to the image of his Son as the firstborn among many brethren before the actual creation took place. God's omnipresence proves that God's Spirit, as the Heavenly Father who fills the heavens and the earth, could also become a man as the arm of Yahweh revealed without having to leave heaven in the incarnation when God became a man. For God is a Spirit who fills heaven and earth, and they that worship Him must worship Him in that Spirit and in that truth. After God had become a man through the Virgin, the Holy Spirit of the only true God the Father continued to be the omnipresent Holy Spirit even after the Spirit of God imprinted himself as a human spirit to become the man Christ Jesus. For Hebrews 1.3 proves that Jesus is a reproduction as a copy of the Father's substance of being as a genuine human being on the earth. Although the Father's substance of being was copied or imprinted, the Father's Holy Spirit continued to exist as the unchangeable Spirit of God who continued to fill heaven and earth. The newly formed man Christ Jesus was able to be tempted as a fully complete human being just as he could pray as a fully complete human being on the earth. Therefore, Jesus could not be God with us as God but rather, Emmanuel, God with us as a true man. For God cannot be tempted of evil. God was not a man before the incarnation. Numbers 23, 19 says that God is not a man that he should lie or change his mind. 
So God was not a man before the incarnation, and he is not literally a man after the incarnation either. For the flesh of Jesus Christ is not literally God, nor is the human spirit of Jesus literally God. For when God became a man, he became something distinct from God, a true man, a true son. Therefore, Jesus Christ is not God with us as God, but God with us as a true man who could pray, who could be tempted, and had a fully complete human nature, for he was made exactly like his brethren, fully human in every way, according to Hebrews 2.17. 1 Timothy 2.5 proves that there is only one true God the Father and only one mediator between that God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Thus we have one divine person, one divine individual father, and one human person, one individual human son. Notice how 1 Timothy 2.5 leaves out the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is the spirit of the only true God the Father who fills heaven and earth. So we only have one divine person called the Father and one human person called the Son. Hebrews 1.3 proves that the human Son was made as the exact imprint of the Father's substance of being as a fully complete human being in the incarnation via the Virgin. Therefore, Hebrews 1.3 proves that the Son is the radiance of His glory. Whose glory? The Father's glory. And the express image of His person. Whose person? The express image of the Father's person as a fully complete human person. This proves that the deity of Jesus Christ could not be another distinct divine person apart from the only true God, the Father. For Jesus himself stated in John 17, 3, that the Father is the only true God. And of course, Jesus is the arm of Yahweh that only true God, the Father, revealed to us as a man. Trinitarian theology depends on the personal distinction between God, the omnipresent Spirit of the Father, and His only begotten child born and son given. Yet these distinctions do not support a co-equal and alleged co-eternal son person. The Word and the Spirit of God are simply manifestations or emanations of the only true God, the Father, who also incarnated himself as the man Christ Jesus. The Son became known as the eternally begotten Son through the writings of men like Augustine of Hippo, who ministered between 385 and 430 A.D., that was exactly the same time when they began praying to Mary. So the Son became known as the eternally begotten Son through the writings of men like Augustine of Hippo, who explained Psalm 2-7 by writing, and I quote, Your years are one day, and your day is not daily, but today, because your today yields not tomorrow, for neither does it follow yesterday. Your today is eternity, Therefore you beget the co-eternal Son to whom you said, This day have I begotten you. So Augustine taught that the Son was born on an eternal day. Psalm 2.7 says, You are my Son, this day have I begotten you. The Hebrew word for day is yom, it means a literal day. And the Hebrew word for begotten means, uh, from Yolad, uh, means a, a, a true birth to bear, to bring forth, or to beget. Could the Son of God have been eternally born, begotten, on an eternal day? The scriptural answer is no, but Augustine said yes. This is how we have received the doctrine of the Trinity, by men like Augustine in the Catholic Church. And at that time, by about 420 through 430 A.D., they were praying to Mary as official church doctrine. The Father, the only true God, can be in heaven and on earth at the same time without becoming two divine persons. We only have one divine individual called the Father and one human offspring called the Son who is the reproduction of the Father's substance of being as a fully complete human being in the Incarnation. 
God did not limit his existence in the Son as if it was his headquarters to rule as the king of heaven and earth. For God said that all of heaven is his throne and that the heaven of heavens cannot contain him because his eternal spirit fills the heavens and the earth. The only omnipresent God, who is a spirit, can simultaneously operate as the Father in heaven while manifesting himself in the body of Jesus Christ as a true human being. It is in this sense that the Father became a completely human son while never having to change or lose any of his divine attributes as the only omnipresent Father who continued to fill heaven and earth while he also simultaneously dwelt on the earth as a man. For Jesus is not God the Father with us as God the Father in a physical body. He is God the Father with us in a new manifestation as a fully complete man with a fully complete human spirit, human mindset, and human nature. Now he also had his divine nature uh, united with the physical or human nature, but that does not mean that he became uh, another God person or it doesn't say that Jesus is just a man because Jesus had a divine awareness of his pre-existence when he said before Abraham was I am in John 8 58 an alleged omnipresent son would mean that a heavenly son and an earthly son simultaneously existed at the same time most Trinitarian theologians allege that the son as a distinct divine person was both in heaven and on earth at the same time because Malachi 3 6 says I am Yahweh I change not God couldn't stop being God uh, while Jesus was on the earth God as God continues to be the unchangeable God with all of his unchangeable divine attributes such as omniscience being all-knowing and omnipresent being everywhere present Yet an alleged Trinitarian omnipresent Son person in heaven with God the Father would have to be able to speak and act in heaven while simultaneously existing on the earth as a man. Thus there would have to be a heavenly Son person being able to speak and act in heaven while an earthly Son person would independently be speaking and acting on the earth as a man. Now, if Trinitarian theologians can think of an alleged omnipresent son being able to speak and act in heaven while he was on the earth as a man, then it is not impossible to believe that the Father could speak and act in heaven as the only true God the Father while simultaneously speaking and acting on the earth via his incarnation in Christ Jesus at the same time. With man, this is impossible, but Jesus said, with God, all things are possible in Matthew 19, 26. For the omnipresent God can certainly speak and act in heaven and on earth at the same time through different manifestations. He is our Father as the omnipresent God who fills the heavens and the earth, and he became a true child born and son given as the arm of Yahweh revealed as a true man. It is hard to imagine how an alleged co-equal God the Son person would have been unable to act and speak in the heavens while he simultaneously dwelt on the earth as a man. If an alleged God the Son could act and speak in heaven while dwelling on the earth as a man, then the Trinitarian doctrine also sounds like two Son persons, one as a heavenly Son person and another as an earthly Son person on the earth. Now, if Trinitarians can think of an alleged heavenly son being able to act and speak in heaven while simultaneously dwelling on the earth as a man, it is not hard to think of our heavenly father being able to speak and act from heaven while also speaking and acting on the earth as a genuine man. For with God, all things are possible. There is only one invisible God who was our father, and one visible man, who is that God who became a man to save us from our sins. Colossians 1.15 says that Jesus, the Son, is the image of the invisible God, 
the firstborn of all creation. Psalm 110.1 says, Yahweh said to my Lord, when you read the English translation, it says, the Lord said to my Lord, if you notice, it's capital L-O-R-D for the divine name Yahweh or Jehovah, said to my Lord, uh, capital L and then small case O-R-D, which is the Hebrew word Adon or Adonai. So Yahweh said to my Lord, my human Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies the footstool of your feet. Here we have one Yahweh person, the only true God the Father, and one human person, the human son, rather than two co-equal Yahweh Lord persons. If Jesus had eternally existed as an alleged Yahweh God the Son beside the Father throughout eternity past, then why did the Father say to the Son, sit at my right hand, if he was already at the Father's right hand to begin with? So we know that Jesus as a Son was not at the right hand of the Father before the incarnation took place. Peter cited Psalm 110.1 in Acts 2, 34 and 35 to show that a post-incarnational Jesus would ascend into heaven as a human son to fulfill this prophecy in Psalm 110.1. Acts 2, 34, 35, Peter said, and I quote, For it was not David, not King David, who ascended into heaven, but he himself says, The Lord, Yahweh, said to my Lord, Adon, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool of your feet. Wherefore, just as 1 Timothy 2.5 says that there is only one God who is our Father, and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, so Psalm 110.1 says that there is only one Yahweh, God the Father, and one fully human Son, who is that God and Father with us as a true man. For God became a man. Emmanuel, God with us as a true man. What about the Lamb of Revelation chapter 5? We definitely have a distinction between God the Father on the throne and the Lamb who is the man who appeared before God the Father to take the scroll out of the Father's hand. We know this is a prophetic vision out of Revelation 5, 6-9 because God does not have a physical hand. Revelation 5, 6-9 says, and I quote, In the midst of the throne stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes. We know Jesus does not literally have seven horns and seven eyes, so this is a symbolic prophetic vision. So in the midst of the throne stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven heads and seven, I'm sorry, seven heads, seven horns and seven eyes. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood. Here we have only one God, one God the Father person on one single throne and one human person who took the book from the God person seated on the throne. Note the use of the words, stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes. The vision speaks not of Christ's deity, it speaks of his true humanity symbolically as a lamb, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. Wherefore, we have one God and one man in this passage of Scripture. Not two God persons, but one God person as one individual God and one individual person called the Lamb, the man Christ Jesus. Also notice that this one man person has redeemed us to one God person. You have redeemed us to God by your blood. It does not state that a second divine God person redeemed us to another distinct divine God person called the Father. Thus there is clearly a distinction between Christ's true humanity and God's divinity. God, according to Scripture, became one of us, a true 
man. Could Jesus as a son have been just a man or just a created angelic being? Some people say that Jesus is a very special man or Jesus is a very special angel as a created being. If Jesus is not God who also became a man, then how is it that Jesus can now hear and answer prayer as God? Jesus clearly said in John 14, 14, if you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Only the omnipresent God who fills heaven and earth can hear and answer prayer as God. Now, if Jesus can hear and answer prayer, obviously people's prayers from all over the world, then he has to be omnipresent like God. And again, Ephesians 4.10 says, if Jesus, um, I'm sorry, Ephesians 4.10 says, and I quote, he who descended is himself also he who ascended far above all the heavens so that he might fill all things. If Jesus is not God, then how is it that Jesus now fills all things as God, according to Ephesians 4.10? For only God fills the heavens and the earth. Jeremiah 23, 24 says that God's Spirit fills the heavens and the earth. If Jesus is not God, then how is it that Jesus' Spirit now indwells all true Christian believers as the omnipresent Spirit? Galatians 4, 7 says, I'm sorry, Galatians 4, 6 says, Because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. For when God's spirit became a human spirit, he didn't cease becoming a human spirit. That human spirit ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. So when we speak of the human spirit of Christ, we're speaking of God's Holy Spirit entering into a new manifestation by becoming a human spirit that was limited on the earth as a man. And then when the Son of God descended into Hades, took the keys of death and hell, and then ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things, according to Ephesians 4.10, that human spirit was incorporated back into the divine spirit, and that new manifestation of a spirit of priestliness, the paraclete, which literally means uh, advocate and intercessor, is now the Holy Spirit inside the hearts of true believers who intercedes to God, crying out, Abba, Father. For God also became a man. He didn't cease becoming a man after Jesus ascended up into heaven. Jesus is still a man and a high priest at the right hand of God the Father. We do not deny the distinction between the Father and the Son. For God became a true man, a true human offspring, a son. Again, Romans 8, 9 says, You are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you, but if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. Notice how the Apostle Paul spoke of the Spirit of God interchangeably as the same Spirit, which is Christ. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be the Spirit of God dwells in you, but if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. So the Spirit of Christ is the Spirit of God, proving that Jesus Christ is God who became a man. Again, John 14, 17 through 18 says, The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it does not see him or know him, but you know him, because he abides with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. So Jesus is the spirit of truth who was with the disciples, but would be in the disciples when he said, I will not leave his orphans, I will come to you. 2 Corinthians 3.17 says, Now the Lord is the spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Just six verses down, uh, Paul wrote, We preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord. Since Christ Jesus is the Lord in context, in 2 Corinthians chapters 3 and 4, since Christ Jesus is the Lord, the Lord is the Spirit, means that Jesus Christ is the Lord and He is the Spirit who indwells the hearts of all true believers. What created angel or human being can be omnipresent, meaning everywhere present at the same time like God, while not being God? 
For Yahweh God the Father himself declared in Isaiah 46, 9, that there is none like me. And I quote, God said, I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me. Since Jesus is exactly like God, by hearing and answering prayers, by being omnipresent, by, by having the nature of God the Father and doing the works of God the Father, he said, the Father who dwells in me, he does the works. Jesus Christ must be the full incarnation of that only true God the Father who was in Christ to reconcile the world to himself in order to save humanity from their sins. God bless you all. In Jesus' name, I trust this has been a blessing. We have many free books, articles, and videos at our website at apostolicchristianfaith.com. God bless.